Hi everyone. This is a video describing the assignment one for mobile programming. Uh, the text of the specification for the assignment is specified on the course wiki. So if you go, go to the course wiki on GitLab, um, assignments are at the top. So then if you go to assignment one, you will see the specification and all the descriptions of what to do and how to implement it. Um, I will talk a little bit about the code in a moment. First, I want to uh, tell you about the assignment template. So we didn't want to change the location of where the materials are for the course. So course IMT3673 slash IMT3673 2020. That's where the main code base is for the lectures, uh, labs, and for the wiki, and for the course issue tracker. So all the submissions, uh, all the assignments will be in a separate place, which you will be able to fork. So to allow that, you have to go to IMT3673, like the top level, and then you will see there are two folders. So one is dash 2020 and one is 2020 space IMT3673. So this is a group, this is a project. Uh, the group can have can have uh, sub-projects and subgroups. A project can't have subgroups. So we had to sort of migrate to this one, uh, but we kept all the lectures and all the wiki and issue tracker here. Uh, so just not to get confused. So the location of this one is course slash IMT3673 slash 2020. Uh, just for the description, we have this extra text here, but if you check in the URL, if you go there, it, it just has 2020. And then it has two subfolders, one for students, one for assignments. You should request access to this one, and then we will give you maintainer, maintainer's access. And then under here, by changing this button to new subgroup, you will be able to create a new subgroup, which should have your NTNU login as the name, same as Carl kind of did here. Um, so request an access to the students uh, subgroup. Uh, let me just check if someone already requested that. Uh, no, so no access requests yet. Um, and then request an access to assignments. Assignments is where all the projects will be. So the projects will be here, uh, and then you will fork them under the subgroup of students uh, under your private, privately owned subgroup. And then you can work on your assignments there. Um, we will remove all the students from the top level, so then nobody should see your individual projects or individual assignments. Uh, and then you can use them for submitting merge requests or doing something with Git with us. We will most likely push some updates to tests uh, to this top upstream level repo. Um, because as you submit your contributions, we may discover some inconsistencies or some problems to the uh, tests. Also, students are encouraged to submit merge requests such that we can um, merge the new tests into the repository. So the repository is here. You will um, basically fork it. Um, you can fork it under your student slash your NTNU username group, subgroup and then work on it. The subgroup will be owned by you and you will manage the access. You can use the same placeholder for your projects. So if you want to have projects later on for further assignments, you can create them under students as well. Um, the project description names in GitLab are different to the URLs which are used for the actual uh, projects. So if you check here, the URL has kind of a very descriptive name uh, of the course assignment one 2020 group expenses, whereas for the text we just make kind of a short short notation. So sometimes this is shorter than the URL, and for example, in the case of the of this group, the URL is shorter than the name. Um, so I hope this is this makes sense. If you have any questions, ask me during the lecture uh, next week. So this is the code base for the assignment. Um, the specification is on the wiki in the where the lectures are, and this one is just the code. Um, so we don't uh, expect 
sort of to use um, an issue tracker or uh, anything related to the project directly here, use the global one. And there in the global one, so if I go back to, yeah, if I, yeah, the easiest way is just to cut the URL. So if I go to the top level lecture, um, you will notice that, so if I go to our lecture space, lecture project, uh, and if you want to uh, submit queries or questions related to, um, to the assignment, you will see that there is a, so if I say new issue, um, no, that's new project. Let me just change that. So, yeah, I want to check, check, change, check, show, show you the labels. Um, so we have, um, where are the labels? Yeah, let's just try to see that. Okay, uh, for some reason the labels are missing here. I will I will fix that. So I will add labels uh, related to assignment, um, and we will use the. Yeah, I probably did that in the wrong place, so I might have added the. Let me just double check. I might have added the labels under the assignments already. So if I go to this project and check those labels, no? Okay, so I, I remember creating all the labels, but somehow I probably misconfigured something. Anyway, there will be labels related to Kotlin, related to assignments and related to um, uh, the project uh, and general discussions under the, the course lecture which is here uh, you already have access to that because uh, you've requested the developers access but for the other two you will have to uh, do it manually so let me just double check the labels again no okay so for some reason i kind of missed that so i will kind of create the labels here for uh, assignment assignment related to assignments and let's say those are important maybe we'll, we'll mark as red uh, all issues questions assignments all right and we can have another one Kotlin All right, let's make Kotlin nice blue And let's have another one about Android This one let's make green okay so we have the general ones if you don't if your question or issue doesn't fit into any of those just create it without issues or without the label and then I will kind of uh, add labels later I think as developer you might be able to add labels as well uh, but if the label already exists then use the one which already exists anyway um, if we go back to the wiki the description of the Forking of the project is kind of described at the top. Um, and then you have, so here is like how you should use the student subgroup. Uh, the submission system will ask you for the, for the repo URL. Uh, and then we have the kind of the logic of the scenario. Um, I will not go through the logic. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can discuss it in the class. What I want to do is I want to go a little bit into the, um, analysis of what you will need to implement and how can you do that and what are the typical um, Kotlin 
kind of patterns that you might be using. So the code for the assignment is organized into classes. Yes, let me just make this slightly bigger so it will be easier on the, on the stream. So let's make this 16. And then the editor. Let's make 16 as well. All right, so the code is organized into single package, which is called IMT3673 assignment uh, group expenses. Uh, and then all the classes are kept in individual uh, Kotlin class files. So expenses contain a single class called expenses. Main activity is a main activity for the project. Single exp expense is also a class and the transactions is a class. Everything that is not a class is kind of in constants uh, file. So it has constants, but it also has some utility functions and you will need to implement them. So first let's have a look into main activity. In main activity, we basically have a very primitive uh, setup for the UI. So you, you are required to implement the setting up of the UI um, um, for the main activity. And then it's a little bit up to you uh, whether you want to use fragments or whether you want to split your logic into different activities and call each activity yourself. Uh, the tests don't care if you're using um, fragments or if you're using um, uh, activities. They basically check what is visible on the screen and navigate through the UI, same, same as it is explained here. Uh, so you're kind of expected to have um, different views, kind of a main activity view, data entry view, uh, settlement view, and those three views, you can kind of navigate as different activities or you can have a single activity which manages the, the views. Um, it's up to you. It's nicer if you use um, if you use the um, single activity for the main activity and for the settlement view. Uh, otherwise, you have to pass uh, and or share or the transactions data between the activities. If you keep it in a single activity, like it is kind of uh, designed here, then all your views can kind of access it here. So there are two uh, fields. Uh, one is um, immutable, so you're not gonna change it. Uh, the instance of it, you will be manipulating the content, but not the, the reference. It's called expenses. And the other one is the list of transactions which are needed for the settlement. So this, of course, will be changing depending you know, of, your, of your data. And then there is a update settlement function which calculates um, the on the basis of the current expenses, it generates a new list of transactions that needs to be executed to settle the, um, the expenses. And this function is inside the constants um, file. So there is a calculate settlement utility function which takes expenses and returns uh, a list of transactions which are used to settle the account. So for example, if we have expenses like Alice gave 20, Bob 20, Charlie 30, and David 50, then to settle that everybody contributed equally, uh, you need to have two transactions. From Alice to David to pass 10. So Alice needs to pay David 10, and Bob needs to pay David 10. And if they do that, then everybody has contributed 30, and it's kind of a settled, right? So. For this dummy example, this function as an example returns a list of two transactions from Alice to David and from Bob to David. All right, so um, you should have no major trouble uh, following the comments and following the kind of a to do of what needs to be implemented. Um, once you've implemented everything, uh, there are two types of tests. So there is uh, UI tests, which live in the Android test folder. And there is a group expenses tests, which live in the um, test folder for JUnit tests. 
All this logic uh, is tested both. It's tested kind of through JUnit and through the UI. Um, if you start by implementing the logic in the constants, constants file, and you will need to implement the expenses class, uh, because expenses class is not implemented, it has just the skeleton methods. So the copy method is implemented, uh, but um, all expenses, amount for, and so on, all none of those methods is implemented yet. Uh, so those methods are tested in the expenses test, and then the constants methods are tested in the constants test. Uh, if you set up your Android Studio to use JUnit, uh, you can run the tests, and the project, as it is in the template, should compile and it should execute all the tests. Some tests will pass because I, for example, tested for this dummy data that it did correctly for this dummy <laughs> setup, um, just to make sure that some of the tests are kind of passing. So all the tests will kind of uh, compile and run, but not, not all the tests will, um, will work. So most of the tests should fail. So none of the tests for expenses class pass. None of the sanitation sanitize tests pass. But some for ca calculation of settlement pass just by you know chance uh, because uh, the default return values are kind of what the test expects. Uh, once you implement everything, so let me just show you. I've implemented I will close. Um, I will close those. Uh, I will change to. So let me just. Uh, clear that and go. Uh, get check out Marius. I've implemented the logic for the uh, for the system. And now if I run my JUnit tests on my implementations, uh, you will see that um, hopefully all the tests pass. Um, if you have no, um, so you can see all the tests are green, everything passes correctly, so my implementation kind of satisfies all the tests which are in the template. Um, I will go back to master. Uh, about branching, because you are encouraged to submit tests, uh, and the tests live in separate folders, uh, separate folders and se separate files. Um, it's good if you branch your development into tests and then keep that branch separate from your normal work on your project. And then if you have some tests to contribute, you can just uh, do a merge request on the branch that doesn't implement anything, just ha have tests. That's what I did also. So I have... Um, my master branch, which I used for the development of the template, and I have my Marius branch, which I used to implement the logic, and I kept them separate so I can push upstream some of the updates to the tests that I've done. So that's the kind of uh, hint that I can give you. Um, I have a couple of um, hints uh, for you to, to play with. Um, so the first one relates to the yeah, let's let's quickly have a look at the um, expenses uh, class. It's a simple placeholder for storing all the expenses. Expenses are implemented as a single exp expense um, instance. So you're basically adding, replacing, uh, removing, and so on, um, single expenses. And this is like a placeholder which manages all the expenses that you will have in your app. Um, by design, a single expense is a very simple immutable data structure uh, which contains a person, an amount the person contributed, and a description what this contribution was for, which is not much used um, for the logic, it's just used for the UI. Um, and then we have a utility function for printing the content of this just for debugging. I've used it when I was developing my own implementation. Um, so when you manipulating single expenses, you'll realize that you can't change the amount. Uh, you have to create a new instance with the same person and the same description 
and changing the amount requires you to create a new instance of a single expense. Um, you might kind of wonder why we don't make an amount variable and then make this object more mutable. Uh, but when dealing with financial operations and financial systems, making things mutable, I mean, you need to pay attention. Why, you know, a single expense amount would change, right? So it is safer if we make those things immutable and then every time you need to do something new, you kind of create a new instance. So you will realize that sometimes you need to create uh, a copy of the single expense with a different amount. Basically, you know, call a constructor, you say single expense, and then you copy from the previous object the person and the description, and then you manipulate the amount. Um, it's not um, a major problem. Amounts are long, uh, but we use a, kind of a normal currency logic, which means we have the integer part and we have the part which is um, after the comma, the ore or cents. Uh, and it has two decimal places, right? We represent them as long. Uh, so if I go, yeah, let me just go to constants. And you see here, uh, Alice, so Alice paid, um, Alice paid somebody 20, let's say, oops, uh, 20 krona with zero ore. So that's the amount, but we represent it as 2000, right? So we shift everything into integers. So then we can do integer operations instead of floating point operations. Um, so if I want to represent um, 20, let's say 25 krona 50 ore, then I would have 2550. Um, one complication is that um, the separator, decimal separator, depends on the locale. So sometimes it's dot, sometimes it's um, comma. And for some things, like uh, for example, convert string to amount, you have to convert a string like uh, 19.99 into something that uh, returns a long value. Um, not a float. And then it's the same with the comma. So the tests will check if your parsing works with dot and or with comma. It's a little bit tricky. Uh, it's a little bit tricky because if you... Yeah, let me just um, revert those changes so I don't need to commit anything. And let me just create a kind of a new dummy file. Um, so I don't mess up with this demonstration. No, I don't want to add this. So for example, if you have a function that converts uh, your string to long, right? Uh, so you will take a string as, as a parameter and you need to create a long uh, response. It's that syntax. So the, the problem is if this S is unparsable, um, so let's say I put dummy, right? So what's the, what's the long value of dummy? Well, it's illegal, right? It's wrong. So I have an error, right? Um, so we have a choice. Um, it, we could do, um, because we operate with uh, strings, we could isolate a particular value of long to represent an error, right? So for example, if we only had uh, positive uh, numbers, we could say minus one means there was an error. An error. But what if we pass, what if we pass um, CL and we pass minus one, right? What would we expect? Well, minus one, but what if we pass minus four? It's, a, no, it's not an error, it's minus four, right? So this kind of approach where we represent 
an erroneous situation as some kind of a specific value is not really nice and it's kind of like a hack. So instead, what we would like to do is um, we would like to somehow represent um, an error situation as kind of a, as a value that can be recognized as, as an error. So normally what we do is, for example, if we have a person uh, P, um, so we have a P which is of type person, and we have some sort of a function which returns us person, and then this function cannot return us a, a, a person, so then the function will return us null, right? Uh, and then we can check, okay, was it null or wasn't, and, and have kind of deal with the error. But because in this particular case, uh, we can't really represent a long a, a number as null. Um, we, I mean, we could um, we could use the um, null value technically as as an error. So what we could do is we could say uh, this function returns null if there was an error or oops null if there was an error and returns a number which is long if the parsing was kind of successful. Um, and that's one way of dealing with it, uh, but a nicer way and a little bit more um, functional way of dealing with it is to uh, wrap the result into a kind of a, yeah, so one more time. So we could represent null as a, a error situation from this function, right? So let's say we call um, this function and it returns us null. Uh, and then what we expected was a number. Um, and then we can have another function, which also returns us null, and we might have expected a different type. Let's say here we expected a string, right? So when we have the logic of the program and something happens, and then we do the if check. So if something is an error, uh, we kind of need to remember what was the original type of what the uh, intention was. Otherwise, from null, we don't know what it is null for. Is this null for a number, or is this null for a string, or is this null for a person, right? So null doesn't communicate to us what was the original type which is giving us null now because we lost the type information, right? So in some languages you have to do this this way, uh, but a more modern and more uh, kind of a functional way of doing it is to have kind of a type information, um, type associated, associated with error, right? So if we have erroneous situation, we maintain what this error is for originally, so then we kind of have kind of a null typed, right? So we have kind of a something like null, but it is it co provides us type information together with the information that something went wrong, okay? So, all right, so, oops, come on. So, Let's delete this um, and let's look into result. Result, if I bring up the, so go Kotlin result. Um, result is a type um, that is parameterized and it has, um, Two situation. So in one situation, it provides us with the um, with the outcome that we expect and with the type that we expect. And then in the failure situation, you can chain it with a particular exception or particular error um, that explains what went wrong. Um, and it it is kind of like a single type which has two slots. And one is the successful slot and one is the failed slot. Um, so what we want is we want, for this particular case, we want um, our method converting from string to long to return as a result. And then if we have, um, 
So if we have when everything is fine, we return result success and we put kind of a number here, right? So we will have some sort of a, yeah, let's say value num equals 10 and it's long and then we return successfully 10. But what if our parsing of the string kind of failed and we can't convert it to a long, then what we do is we return result. It's also the same, it's also a result, it's the same type. But this time we we have a failure and then we can say, we can like, if we failed because of a particular exception E, we can pass it here, uh, but we can also just throw a new exception and say what went wrong, like uh, custom parsing error or something. So we can pass uh, an exception to the, as a return to say, you know, something went wrong and then whoever is calling us can extract the error information. So instead of returning null, which doesn't convey anything, uh, we provide kind of a more typed more type safe response and then uh, when everything is fine we return a success and when we have a failure we kind of return an exception why why we've had a failure y typically uh, you will get kind of um, an exception here of type exception or throwable and then you would just pass it as a parameter to failure um, <clears throat> so I hope this is kind of uh, relatively clean uh, an easy way of dealing with the erroneous situations. And this is exactly what we use in constants. So in constants, when you have the conversion from the string to an, to an amount, we passing string and we expect a result, which is a long, or if there is a failure, we expect an exception of what went wrong, right? In our case, you know, we, <laughs> manually converted some predefined strings so then I can test them and then for everything else we return a failure but of course you're gonna delete all of that and implement your own logic for the for this method so one extra caveat when when I started this discussion is about the result the other one is about the comma right so uh, the string will have um, Okay, let me just read this. So, uh, S has um, a parsing method which can be used to parse it to a float, right? So if I do this and I say I have my float here, um, then I can turn the float so if I say my float, um, so return result, uh, and it's a success, and we have our float, we multiply it by 100 because we need to shift the, um, uh, the decimal place, and this is still a float, and we need to convert it to, um, so, no, 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 let's say around it and uh, yes, so round returns us a long unless it's uh, yeah, nice. And then there is a Kotlin function which is called round, so we will use that one. Um, so, yes, and this one, yeah, all right, so let's round to int. All right, all right, so instead of using the Java uh, rounding functions from math package, uh, the ID suggests us to use the round to int, but of course, we want to use the round to long, right? So we mul multiplied our float, and this kind of works fine. That's a very simple way of converting a text S into a float and then passing it. Uh, we need to check. Um, 
So Kotlin um, string to float. We check the method, uh, how it communicates an error. It communicates an error by number format exception. So we need to catch that, that exception. So try catch number format exception. Oops. That's not Java, that's Kotlin. Perfect. And then we basically return result failure. E. So you kind of see how nice it is to um, to work with the result because we can communicate the failure very intuitively to the caller. Uh, and then we have kind of a nice way of um, wrapping our result into the, um, our long result into the result type and then dealing with the exceptional situation very kind of nicely. So there are two things here. One is that a more functional way of dealing with that is to kind of um, lift the return and just have simple return statement instead of having uh, two return statements here. So if we, um, let, if I click here and refactor it, um, we basically use a try catch ex expression as something which um, returns a single value. So in the first case, it returns this. In the second case, it returns this, in the exceptional case. And then return returns either this or that, right? So we have a single return statement with kind of a lifted um, try and catch. The second thing is, um, so I kind of implemented the, the conversion for you. Uh, however, it will not pass all the tests. It will pass most of the tests, but not all of them. Um, so S can be like 19 or 10.00, which is fine. It can be uh, 10, which will be fine as well. But it can also be 10 like this. And in this case, your method will throw an exception because it will not recognize the locale, which for my default setup is dot, right? Uh, so the to float method, you realize is inflexible enough to deal with the comma or with the dot. Um, so this you need to deal with yourself. You have to somehow fix the problem of allowing the user to type in either 10 dot zero zero or 10 comma zero zero and it should always you know it should return basically um thousand uh, right so it's uh, two decimal places compacted and so it should always return a uh, thousand no matter which of these i will use okay so that's one catch for the conversion from string to um to number uh, there is another small catch when you're converting from um, from number to a string, right? So if I have a number, let's say um, I have a value which is f, which is 10, float, right? And now I need to get a value which is a string out of this. How would I do that? Well, you know, there is a toString method. Um, so what will to string method print for this? Okay, most likely it will print 10, right? Uh, what it will print for this? It will do this. But what we want, we want a text which is always formatted like this with two decimal places and even if they are zeros, you kind of nicely print zeros. So to string will not solve your problem. Again, you need to think a little bit more how you will solve it. Uh, how you will format your string to have kind of a two, two decimal places. All right, so that's um, those are kind of a two edge cases that you will have to deal with. Um, as explained in the specification, um, the expenses, uh, like single expense, um, 
use a person as a string. Th this is not very nice. Uh, we should have a proper type to represent people. Um, but, you know, just for the simplicity's sake, we kind of did this simplification. Um, the same is for the amounts. So amount should have a kind of a financial type, which is associated with, an, with the amounts. So then, by mistake, it should not consume numbers, right? It should only consume money. Uh, but again, for simplification, we use long. So that's fine. Um, there is one more thing for uh, me to explain um, related to the settlement. Uh, also, sanitized name is a little bit complex, um, and the complexity comes from the use of dash. So, unlike basic application, where we basically extracted the two tokens and capitalized the first letter, uh, if you go into the description of the um, of the sanitize. Um, Where is the, yeah, maybe in code, let's go to the code. Um, no, it should be somewhere, yeah, here. So names, um, so there are certain rules you have to follow. So um, the first letter of each name token is always capitalized and the spaces of course are trimmed uh, and if the um, the tokens can be either separated by a space or can be joined by a by a dash um, so everything that is not letters should be trimmed out uh, so no special characters non punctuation and no numbers but dash can be used uh, and then um, single token or double token names are accepted and if you have dash then the whole token is considered as a single token so if someone is called um, Jens Petter and Jens dash Petter that's just one token and then they can have a second token but within this um, Jens the, the, the J the E and then P for Peter should be both capitalized. So the, so the, num the letters around the dash kind of you need to deal with. So there is a little bit of work to kind of uh, do that right. Uh, you will see from the tests if you, if you are doing it right or not. Um, and then for the settlement. Uh, so for the settlement we've already discussed, there is just one uh, note. Obviously for this particular settlement, um, we have a perfect split, right? So we have a perfect split where everybody kind of contributed 10 um, and then everybody is like everybody contributed 30 and the total is um, 100, uh, 120 and it kind of adds up. But you can imagine that sometimes the split is uneven, right? So let's say um, I might have a situation where this person paid 10 and then none of them paid anything right so then if we were um, to equally split uh, split this amount uh, we would have to do so if I say 10 divided yeah you know 10 is a, a wrong number so let's say 11 uh, divided by 4 uh, 11 is also a bad number, um, but let's say we will do fractions. So let's let me do that with 11. But instead of saying 11, let's say this person paid yay much, right? Um, so then everybody should contribute uh, 0 0.275. But that this five is an extra, right? So what will happen is if everybody, like now we have to have some sort of a rounding rule, right? So we cannot go less than a cent or less than aura. Um, so, uh, oops. So we have, everybody is contributing 2.7. 
uh, but we have the kind of uh, missing five, right? So if we have a rule that rounds five up, then this will be eight, eight, eight. And then if all those people add this together, so the, the person who paid 1.1, now we have to do minus 3 times um, 0, 28. Then you can see that this person will effectively pay um, 0, 26, right? So those people paid 28, but this person paid 26 because um, originally it paid that much, but he got this extra um, rounded values up, so it's not even, right? There is no possible even solution because we have something which is subsent. Uh, and in financial terms, we cannot give back somebody less than a cent. We have to round it up. So we either come up short on this end, so then we say, okay, everybody will add, we round this extra five down, in which case this person will get 29, right? So instead of paying less, now this person paid um, two cents more than everybody else, but, you know, that's just unsolvable kind of dilemma, like how to settle something that is sub-cent, right? So if something is rounded to cents and it's, it adds up correctly, then it's fine. But we could potentially have a settlement which is short because of the rounding error of one or two cents. It, you know, the maximum amount, it will be kind of um, unequal here is two because we or three maybe, um, could be, yeah, could be three. Um, so if we have a rule um, that rounds the numbers up and down, so something that is zero, you know, zero, zero, five, one, will get to zero, zero, one, and something that is 00049 will get down to 00. Then we kind of are missing, um, you know, uh, we're missing one extra cent, even though um, uh, the calculations are kind of correct, but we cannot make a transaction which is less than a, a single cent. Um, so if this person supposed to pay that much, it will actually pay uh, 49, um, uh, it, it will pay one cent, which is um, a little bit more than it should. And, uh, and the same is here. So depending how this distribution kind of works out here, uh, the final settlement, so one of those people can be one or two cents more than everybody else. And everybody else is kind of the same but the last one, it kind of um, might end up with something else. It could also end up, you could end up with like situation like this, right? So if you, if you split the bill like this and say there is um, plus zero to seven, plus zero to eight, plus zero to eight, then it kind of nicely adds up to 1.1, same as the original bill was, but then everybody's kind of, you know, plus minus one, right? So it can be um, plus minus, plus minus um, half of the people. So, so if I have four people, I can have, uh, you know, half the cent missing. So uh, four people times half, that's two. Uh, so I can have plus minus two at maximum, which is kind of uneven. So most people might have even number and then this one will be plus minus two, 
I, I hope it makes sense. So the tests take that into account. So the tests kind of uh, uh, accommodate that. And um, even if you uh, split the, um, the amounts like this, or like this, seven and a half, um, like this, it's fine, right? So um, you, your solution will be considered correct because that it's not possible to have a perfectly unified thing up to a single cent. Um, so that, that's just um, uh, a caveat. Uh, you should try to make the minimum number of transactions, right? So of course you can kind of try to brute force it by paying cents, uh, but that that makes yeah that that's a bad solution. So you should try kind of a minimum amount of settlement transactions that would settle the account. Um, all right, so I think that's uh, that's all. Um, if you have further questions, uh, we can discuss it during the during the class. Yeah, thank you.